And welcome back to Inquiring Minds. My name is Doug. Thanks for joining me on Pen Resurrection Sunday. I've been on a bit of a break from restoring pens for Sunday videos. With the huge numbers of pens coming from Hongdian, Asvine, Majon, and Jinhao during the holiday season, I was up to my armpits in new pen reviews. Plus, I needed to refill the vintage pen acquisition budget with my January pen sale. And keep watching my Wix webpage for sales of vintage and previously restored pens for sale as I'll be adding pens to my sale list periodically. I want to welcome back all of you fans of Pen Resurrections where I take previously dead or not feeling very well but will be dead soon. I'm not dead! Yeah, he says he's not dead. Yes, he is. I'm not! I don't want to go on the car! Oh, don't be such a baby. I feel happy! Ah, oh, thanks very much. Pens and bring them back to life. I've decided to change up the format of the Pen Resurrection Sunday videos, and I've decided not to use the same format I use to review new pens, as I want to focus more on the restoration process itself. I was inspired by a particular YouTube channel rabbit hole I fell into recently. I purchased, disassembled, and restored this vintage Apple keyboard recently, and I watched a bunch of vintage computing videos on YouTube as research. I found myself watching hours of this particular guy's YouTube channel, called Adrian's Basement. Adrian Black gathers up old computers and computer parts, puts them on his bench, and films his process for getting them running again, or not. Even though 90% of the time I haven't got a clue what he's talking about with electronics, watching his process of restoring old computers, some of which I used to own and love, like the Commodore 64, the Compact Desk Pro 286, and the IBM PC-80, is strangely fascinating. I thought much of the process that I go through to restore a fountain pen would be boring video to watch, so I'd cut much of the process to get to the results. Plus, I'd edit out all my damn it moments where I screwed up or got frustrated. But those are some of my favorite moments in Adrian's process, and I'd watch him work and talk for hours. It might be that Adrian is just a charming fellow who is a total geek and gearhead. Bill, that is not sexy. Yes, it is. Which might be something I like about him. So I'm going to approach today's resurrection completely differently. And I need you folks to tell me if you like the new format or want the old format. Recently, a viewer and pen friend, John Summers, sent me a box full of some incredible vintage fountain pens that needed restoration. He gave me two Schaefer's, a Parker, and a Waterman's 100-year pen. And here are the four pens. Here's the Waterman 100-year pen. This is a 1960s Schaefer PFM. This is a 1940s Schaefer touchdown filler, and this is a Parker Duofold Speedline filler. So I'm going to start with the Waterman's 100-year pen and see if I can bring it back from the dead for you today. So let's get started. This is the first Waterman's 100-year pen I've ever held, and this one here is from the last years of its production. I'm guessing between 1943 and 1946 as there are no date codes on this pen. Waterman introduced this model of lever filler pen designed by industrial designer John Vassos in 1939. They made the early ones out of a new material with the trade name Lucite. They gave it an unprecedented 100-year warranty. Early models were ribbed with distinctive mid-barrel bands and distinctive clear Lucite barrel ends. By 1941, the Lucite was replaced by celluloid, again, and the mid-barrel bands were gone. By 1946, Waterman had renamed the model the Emblem, and the 100-year warranty was gone too. A U.S. Supreme Court decision had the same effect on other pen manufacturers' warranties as well. The Schaefer White Dot and the Blue Diamond for Parker, uh, which denoted lifetime warranties, were also eliminated. So let's inspect this at circa 1944 Waterman's 100-year pen and see what it needs to come back into the land of the writing. First of all, this is a fairly big pen. I think this is the oversize version. Let's compare it to a 1944 Parker Vacuumatic Standard. You can see that the Waterman is a bit thicker and about the same length. And here is a 1943 Parker 51 Vacuumatic, which is even slender than the previous two. First off, this box lever 
here does not match the model of this pen. This ideal logo right here and the round end on the end of the lever comes from a previous generation, I think. So that box lever has been replaced, I think. You can see the spade shape indent there in the celluloid that doesn't exactly fit. It clips down in there nicely, but it doesn't fit that outline. We have a single wide cap band with nothing on it. We have Waterman's made in the USA, stamped into the back of the cap. And we have the Waterman's very Art Deco clip, which we've seen on other Waterman's that I've restored, like the Stalwart and the uh, Starlet. And that clip is riveted into the cap. So we unscrew the cap and get my loop on this so I can read it. So this says Waterman's 100 year pen. And it looks like a fine and it looks like that nib might need a little bit of work. There's an ebonite feed with an F scratched into it. I don't think that was done by Waterman. And the small flared section, that looks like it's ebonite. Uh, the rest of this pen is celluloid. And the pen posts very nicely. And it's a nice big pen. And that nib is big size. I think that's what they called a number 17. So we'll get our calipers out and measure the base of that. And we get 7.4 millimeters. So it's almost a number eight size nib. Now John sent this to me with a sack already attached. And the sack that he used wasn't exactly big enough. He used a PVC sack. That barrel is quite wide. So you can see if I activate the lever, I had to get my pen light in there to see it, it actually had the pressure bar on there, but you can see that the lever only goes part way across. And so with that PVC narrow kind of sack in there, it was not squishing that. See, it's not putting an indent in that at all, so it won't fill. The proper size sack for this pen is a number 20. And here I've got a, a latex number 20 sack, which we will slip on there. And that will go into the barrel. We'll trim it to size. And you can see now, if I look down that barrel, that that pressure bar actually deflects the latex and will suck up ink. Let's look at the section here. There's the ebonite feed. I'm going to put it in my gizmo to uh, knock that feed out of there. And we'll get the nib out and we'll be able to polish up that feed and polish up that nib and test it uh, before we try to resack the pen. So let me get my gear out. So here's my gear for knocking feeds out of nibs. I've got a stainless steel fractional size drill gauge that I can find the right size hole to block that section. And then you need something for the nib to go down through. Now, I, this is all homemade stuff. <laughs> you can get knockout blocks and they're very convenient and very useful, but they're also very expensive. And I'm, I'm relatively poor, so I don't have gear like that. Uh, so I tend to put the right size hole over a couple of ink buddies. These are some uh, ink buddies that my son printed for me. Uh, here is a partial ink buddy, ink vial storage block. And I put it on top of another nine vial ink buddy block. And then I take the correct size for the section, just enough to get that nib through, but hold the section back. And then I put some stick tack on top of that, find the right one, and get it down over that hole, and push the gauge down over top so it stabilizes it. And then I have an Allen key wrench that's fairly short and the right thickness to be able to just hit flat on the top of that ebonite feed. Stick tack is a wonderful thing. And then I can tap down on it with my soft hammer. Now before I do that, I'm actually going to soak this for a bit in my ultrasonic cleaner, nine parts distilled water and one part uh, ammonia. And that will loosen up some of that old ink that's probably holding that feed in there too and allow it to slide a little bit better through that section. And while we're waiting for the section in the ultrasonic bath, I took my endoscopic camera and looked at how that lever works inside and whether it's rusted or corroded or whether it needs replacing. 
and it looks like it works perfectly and it's in really really good shape so again i'm thinking this is a replacement lever and pressure bar uh, for this particular pen it's not original to the pen it's in the style of a box lever that fits pens from the 1920s and 30s from Waterman. And now that I've got the section out of the ultrasonic bath, and let's see if we can knock this puppy out of here without destroying the pen. I'd have to give myself some more, more height on my camera, or I'll be bashing my camera. That seems to be coming out very nicely. I need to give it a couple of taps just to be able to check on its progress. There, you see it's coming out. And double check on my clearance. Have I got my clearance, Clarence? We have clearance, Clarence. Roger, Roger. What's our vector, Victor? I'm gonna move this over one to here, because that one goes straight through, whereas this one doesn't. Gotta make sure you get these things in the right hole. Nice rocket, really high. Are you gonna say something? Mm, it's coming. That's what she said. <laughs> and we'll try again and tap it the rest of the way through. Tap it a little bit more. There it is. And there's our nib. A lot of black ink in there. Maybe with the camera up close, you can see some markings on there at all at the bottom. Okay, I can't tell by the camera. I'm going to have to get my loop out. It says. 18 made in USA. So that 18 does not mean 18 karat gold, otherwise it'd have a K on it. It means number 18. So they had number 17 and number 18 nibs. These are very large. It's about an eight. When you talk about number five, number six, number eight size nibs, this is like a number eight. And you get that measurement from measuring uh, the diameter of the feed at the base which I get seven and change millimeters. And let's take a look at the feed as well. And there it is, all caked up with ink. And we'll clean that up in the bath as well. And then we'll come back and polish the nib and polish the feed. Now we're gonna take the ebonite section and run it through with a wire cleaner and some distilled water. Did that a lot. So we clean out any extra ink that's inside that section. I've got the ebonite feed clean and inspected the channel to make sure it's clear of any debris. Make sure it's clear of any old ink. And now we can go at the nib. So what I'm gonna do here is get up close and personal and get some handy dandy autosol metal polish and put a little drop right in there and go at it with a cotton swab to get all that extra black ink out of there and we can go at it the top side as well a little bit especially down here where it's been in that section for a hundred years more or less Wipe off the excess and then get my jeweler's cloth out and we can see how bright we can get this nib. It's already looking pretty good. You put your thumb in there and you can actually feel the heat coming through that gold. Gold is a really good conductor of electricity and heat. So there we are, starting to look pretty good. There are quite a few scratches on the upper side there, like someone was trying to adjust it. So I'm going to try to get some of those out. Ooh, that's getting hot. Looking pretty good. Now the bottom side doesn't really need to get any polish, but I like to give it a little bit of a polish. So I put it under the polish cloth and then take a Q-tip and rub into that concave part of the nib. There we are, looking pretty good inside and out. 
and we'll focus on the barrel, the cap, and the section. There's lots and lots of micro scratches and abrasions. There's some abrasions from the cap being posted over the years. So we're going to polish up this celluloid. I'm going to go at the gold on here with my polish cloth. Let's do that first. And then I'll mask it off for when I'm going to be polishing the celluloid. You don't want to even attempt to take that clip out of there because that's riveted in there. You'll never get it back in. So we'll get the polish cloth out here again. And again, you can see there's lots of micro abrasions on that gold band over the years. Same thing with the clip. This is gold plate, so you don't want to go too aggressively on it, but the gold plate from back in the day was a lot thicker than it is today, and that band is moving. You see it there? So I'm going to be very careful with this. There's no chips in the edge of this cap. Sometimes these celluloid caps are so thin here they chip very easily, but one thing about celluloid is it shrinks over time, and so that shrinks and the metal doesn't and so that band is going to spin on there. The only way to keep it from spinning is to inject a little cyanoacrylate glue in there, crazy glue, in there to uh, keep it from rotating. But no matter what you do, that crazy glue is going to blush around the outside of that and you're going to see it. So it's not spinning badly, so I'm going to actually leave it alone. And I'm going to, instead of polishing it this way, I'm going to polish it this way instead. And just the heat of me polishing is causing that gold band to expand even further. So it's looking a lot better, but we'll keep going at it. We're actually polishing up some of that celluloid as well. Now let's go at the clip and see how well that will come up. So I, it's coming up very, very nicely, but I polish a little bit and then I stop and examine it, make sure that I'm not going through that plate into the brass. Doesn't look like I'm going through, and it's come up very, very nicely indeed. Thank you, Waterman, for making this gold plate so well. And then we're going to hook, hook the clip over my polished cloth to get some of the underside as much as we can without distorting the clip at all that's looking pretty good now I'm going to take some masking tape and mask off uh, that cap band and we're going to polish up the cap celluloid along with the celluloid on the barrel the original lever would have been gold plated as well to match the rest of the pen there now I've masked off that gold band with some painters tape and I'm just going to avoid the clip now let's start with the barrel. We'll do the section too. And I'm using two kinds of polish. Uh, they're both from Anderson Pens. There's Anderson Pens Micro Gloss Number no. 5, which I've written compound on, so I can tell them apart. This is the rubbing compound. And then there's the Micro Gloss Number no. 1, which is a polish. So this is heavier grit, this is finer grit. So you start with the micro gloss. I'll try to avoid that lever, but I'm not too worried about it. It's not gold plated. I don't want to go down through that to get any brass at all. So I'll keep an eye on it. I'm using a shop towel here. It actually stands up to the rubbing compound quite well. Now you can use a buffing wheel for this to make it a lot faster, but you're going to go through a lot more material very, very quickly. And this is the safest method, just using good old-fashioned elbow grease and rubbing compound on that celluloid. Now I start with this compound first and then use a microfiber cloth to polish off the polish. And then I inspect it for wear. So if this gets most of the wear and scratches and gouges and things off, then you don't need to be more aggressive. So I'm going to go over it with my loop and check to see if there's any deep gouges. And there's still a lot of micro abrasion there. So I'm going to go at it a little bit more aggressively with some micro mesh. And this is a multi-stage process where I go through the levels of micro mesh uh, from the coarser grades all the way down through 
the very, very fine grades. The course is grit, which is 1500, and we're going to work all the way down through to 12,000. And the deepest scratches are back here, where the pen was posted. And there we go. Nicely matte finished. If there are any deeper grooves, I'd be able to inspect it at this point and be able to see where those are. On this particular pen, I don't see any deeper scratches, but if I did have some, I'd use 400 grit. This is a wet dry sandpaper with a cloth back and is very flexible and gets into those little scratches very nicely. And you can buff those out and then go over it with the 1800 grit. Now I'm gonna go back through all the grits until we get to the finest polish. And now we go after it with that polishing compound again. And that's looking very nice. I will probably give it another polish with the number one. This is a very fine grit polish. Will probably be the best it can be. Much thinner polishing compound. There we go. Now when I'm finished with the cap and the section, I'll probably run some, a little bit of Renaissance wax on that as well to make it even shinier. And I use a dental tool here to go down each one of those threads and get as much of that polishing compound out of there as possible. It's easier just to put it in the groove and give it a turn. There are three starts to that thread, and you can follow each one of them around. I'm going to go at that ebonite uh, feed and the ebonite section. I'm not going to use my polishes for that because uh, this stuff, Meguiar's Mirror Glaze Swirl Remover Number 2, works really nicely on that material, and it's a lot less per ounce than the Anderson pens. So I get a bunch of the polish on the section and we just turn, turn, turn. We'll do the same thing on the inside. But also note that I'm going to put this in the ultrasonic bath again to get all the residual polish off of there because I don't want to inhibit the flow of ink when we get to that point. Look at that amount of old ink we're getting out of there. See, it's polished up very, very nicely. I could go at that with some micromesh because it is a little bit oxidized. You can see it's a little bit tan looking. And there, now the same thing for the feed. Now I'm only going to polish the underside. This side doesn't need any polish. In fact, I don't, I want to keep as much of that polish away from those channels as possible. I'm just going to polish the part that's visible. And maybe we'll get that F that someone scratched in there off of that feed. Let's take a look. That F is still there. It's shiny. So I'm going to have to go at that with some micro mesh to get that F out of there. FL? FI? I don't know. It will be gone now. And it's gone. Looks like I didn't get all of it, so I'm going back to the beginning. I think I got all of it that time. There we go. And this will go back in the electrosonic bath as well. Now I'm going to masking tape up that clip after all, because I'm not just going to use polish. I'm going to be using micro mesh on this too. There we go. Now I can go at this with a micro mesh. I always keep my pads in order and as I use them, put them back in order and then I can just flip them over and go down through and then flip them over and use them again. Never have to look at the numbers. Now I'm going to avoid as much as possible with the, the coarsest grits this imprint of Waterman made in the USA because I don't want to lose that. 
So if there are some micro abrasions around that logo, uh, that's tough. They're going to have to stay there. I'll try to get up as close as possible to that clip. But again, that clip is permanently there. So you can't get many abrasions under that over time anyway. So underneath the clip should be fairly abrasion free. And then I'll get a shiny line right here where I can't get at it. That area should be relatively abrasion free. And when I polish the, the band, I kind of polished up the celluloid around that anyway. So once I've given this a good once over with the heaviest grit, wipe it off and then inspect it. These holes here in the side of the cap are breather holes uh, so that when you're capping and uncapping your pen, you're not sucking ink in, in and out of the pen and into the cap or onto your shirt sleeves. So I just make sure they're clear do that a few times as we go through here to make sure the breather holes are clear. And I'll take my loop and inspect it for any deep grooves that might need some of the 400 grit. And it looks pretty good. We can proceed with the rest of the micro mesh. Now we're going to run some polish over it. And we shall see. Yeah, not too bad. It's still a bit hazy in places, but that might be polish. So that cap still has a lot of ink down inside, so I'm going to put this in the uh, ultrasonic and get all that out, and then we'll clean the inside of the cap as well. But that's looking pretty good right now. While that cap and probably the barrel is in the ultrasonic, I'm going to look at this nib and see how it writes and see whether there's anything I need to do with it before I put it back in the section with the feed. So I've just masking taped that nib uh, to my glass dip pen and dip it in the ink a little bit just to get the slot a little bit of ink and see how it writes. It's pretty scratchy in that direction it's okay that way, okay down, okay up, scratchy that way. Let's check the flexibility of this nib. It's nice. Look at that. Of course, it hasn't got the feed there to inhibit it, but it's looking pretty good. So I'm going to check the alignment on this and see whether I can adjust that a little bit before we put it back in the section. So under my loop, I can see that that tine right there is slightly below the other one. And just pressing these tines this way doesn't really do anything because it's slightly turned down that way. So I'm going to try to give it some leverage to try to get that tine to go up a little bit. And this is very delicate work, so I have to do it off camera so I can actually see what I'm doing. Pardon the audio quality here. This is the mic on the iPhone because I had to plug it in for power. But what I've done is I've adjusted that nib and I used this block, the little acrylic block that has concave and convex areas on it. And I laid the nib on the convex area and then took my plastic spudger and then just ironed out the little wrinkle. There's a little bit of a wrinkle right there on this nib, which was causing it to deflect down. And so it's a little wobble right there. It had been bent and looked like someone tried to straighten it a little bit, but there's a little wow. There's still a little bit of a wow there, you can see. But I've got the, the tines together, and I did that just by ironing out that little wobble right there with my plastic spudger. Uh, gold is very malleable, and the more you worry it like that, the more it will flatten out. So that seemed to work. So I put the sack on the section, and unfortunately all the video I shot of that process uh, got lost, but I will sort of demonstrate what I did. I took the sack, here's the one that uh, John put in its PVC. I took the latex sack and put the section up against the barrel and measured where the top of the 
nozzle would be. And then I snipped it off at that point, put it on my sack protector, painted shellac around the end of the nozzle, uh, stretched the sack, and then placed it on the end of the nozzle, gave it a little bit of a twist, and then painted it again with some shellac to seal that seam right there. So right now it is dry and that's ready to go into the barrel. I'm going to use a little bit of talc here on that latex sack so that it slides nicely inside that barrel and then slide it in just like that. Now I can test this out and try to fill it with some ink and see whether it works or not to fill this pen. Once I've got that nib working properly and it fills with ink without any leaks, uh, then if I want, I can shellac that section back down again. If it's tight enough that it doesn't turn while you're using it, generally I like to leave it unshellacked so that it's easy to fix if needed. So let's see if we can fill it with some ink. And before we fill it, I like to weigh the pen empty. It is 13.09 grams. We press tear and we see how much ink we can get into the pen. I hear bubbles. That's good. We're going to do that a few times because that lever only presses that sack about halfway. It doesn't really press it very much. Just keep doing that until I hear no more bubbles. And we're getting 0.7 grams or 0.7 milliliters of ink. Not a lot, but it's uh, a good amount. I was worried that we wouldn't get any. So now we have to give this a try. So 1944 Waterman's. Hundred year pen. And it has a fourteen carat gold number seventeen according to Waterman, but it's basically a number eight size nib. And it's got a lot of flex. But is that scratch gone? Yes, it's absolutely gone in all directions. There is some feedback. So I might polish that up a little bit more. I'm going to write with this for a bit, polish it up with some Renaissance wax, and then come back and report. Okay, I've written with this pen for a while now, and anytime I've discovered a little bit of a scratch or drag on the nib, I'll give it a couple of swipes with 8,000 and 12,000 grit micromesh just to polish out those little burrs and it's writing now very wet and smooth with a lot of bounce and flex. So 1944 Waterman's 100 year pen and it has a fine 14 karat gold number 17 nib and you can see what I mean about the flex and it's now very very smooth with feedback and it's nicely juicy <laughs> this is juicy <laughs> very very nice indeed this is truly a vintage writing experience Let's do a beauty pass here and see the pen in all of its glory. My goodness, glory and resurrection all on a Sunday. I might have to take up the collection. <laughs> oh, good. Here comes the collection plate. Thirty cents off shake and bake. Homer! I waxed the cap and the barrel with some Renaissance wax, what we in Canada here call conservator's wax. I get it from Lee Valley. You put a little bit on the barrel and buff it up nice and shiny with a microfiber cloth. There are still some vintage indications on this pen. I got most of the microabrasions out. 
If you look very carefully, there's still some marks that this is vintage. The clip itself and the cap band still have some micro abrasions on them, but I was not wanting to be too much more aggressive in my polishing of those items to keep from going through that plate. And I gave the section another treatment with baby oil and is looking very, very shiny and nice. And that nib came up very nicely as well. Very shiny as well as the feed. The key is that this pen now writes and writes very, very nicely. That's almost no pressure at all on that nib. Most pens of this era are the size of this Parker Vacuumatic from 1944, and you can see that the Waterman is a good deal larger and thicker as well than the Vacuumatic. Oversized fountain pens were made, but they were at a premium, and there just aren't as many of them. So this oversized Waterman 100-year pen is a real treat. And as a thank you to John Summers for gifting me this extraordinary fountain pen, as well as the other three beauties, which I will get to in the coming weeks. As a thank you to John, I'm going to send this restored 80-year-old Waterman back to him. It's in excellent shape now and should write for another 20 years, at which point the Waterman warranty might expire. I know I'll expire long before it does. And there you have it. Let me know in the comments below whether you like this new, more raw format of uh, pen restoration or whether you prefer the more review like resurrections that i've done in the past and as always thank you for watching and that's all she wrote i made this <laughs>